God's important prayer and the fact that Christ will have no part of anything that is short of that. When there has been made plans for Christ and the Greek to take him by force and make him king, and Christ sent them on their way to take the boat across the lake again, <clears throat> they did not they were, they were, they were quite unrepentant for their spirit and attitude and, and uh, practice. Turn now to page 380 of the Desire of Ages. And uh, as they moved across the lake, it says they moved again, they moved because they've been not in the middle of proclaiming the king. They blamed themselves for yielding to, to his command. They reasoned that if they had been more persistent, they would have accomplished their purpose. The disposition had changed. Jesus Christ persisted after they left him and went on their way across the lake. And uh, they were unrepentant for their spirit and behavior, even though Christ had shown they had no part of all with them in this endeavor. Now, the thing became dark and dark before them as unbelief was taking possession of their minds and hearts. The love of God had blinded them. And they felt. Um, this dissatisfied because they had to work with a teacher who was reviled by the priests and rabbis and would not uh, a study of authority make himself king at that time. In the meantime, Christ was praying for them on the shore, but he would not join <coughs> them until they had gained the victory over the disposition of spirit to be the plan makers in the place of Christ himself. We should stress that point because uh, we have to realize that God will have no part at all with any prayer which involves our seeking to change him in the slightest degree whatsoever. Not the, not the slightest. So then comes this dreadful storm which burst upon them so suddenly and unexpectedly and uh, threatened their lives as they sought to control the boat in this fearful tempest. And this storm made them realize their personal helplessness, the need of a savior. And when it came to that point, and they were trying to make Christ different, then he came to them and saved them from their sorrows. Let's move on now to John the 19th chapter. <coughs> This chapter reveals, of course, that that disposition persisted right down until the cross of Calvary. And those men still sought to be the plant makers in God's place and to change Jesus Christ to their way of thinking. This, of course, is a chapter dealing with the foot watching service uh, on the night before Christ's crucifixion. John chapter 30, minus 8, foot 19. We know this story very well, so I shall read the entire chapter tonight, this morning. But uh, when he came to Peter in verse 6, Peter asked the question, Lord, are you washing my feet? Are you washing my feet? In other words, Peter was saying to Christ, what are you doing? What are you saying by what you're doing in washing my feet today? And Christ said in verse 7, What I am doing you do not understand, but you will know after this. And Peter then said, You shall never wash my feet. Now what was Peter saying in full and making that remark on that day, that very strong protestation at that point of time? He was saying in effect, Lord, I don't want your kind of kingdom. I want a different kind of kingdom altogether. I shall have a different kind of kingdom. Now Peter felt that he had strong support for his position, which he did from the human point of view. Peter knew that the Pharisees, the powerful leaders of Israel, would not uh, go along with Christ's kind of kingdom. They desired to have a kingdom of, of glory and power and might and, and so on, as we don't know so well. And he also knew that the rabbis felt the same, the people felt the same, and the other leaders the disciples also felt the same way. So that Peter felt he had the whole world on his side and Christ had no one on his side, so that made a matter of superior numbers. And so Peter felt he could really change Christ, force Christ to change at this point of time, 
by bringing this pressure to bear upon him as he tried to do at that moment of time. Now, was Christ at all impressed by the numbers against him? And the answer is no, absolutely not. Because Christ simply said to him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. So, how much room did Christ make for changing himself in this statement? None. So, in my mind, there's a very powerful argument, of course, in favour of our not doing this, because Christ certainly was outnumbered at this point of time, outnumbered by Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, rabbis, rulers, people, disciples, church members. He stood absolutely alone to this principle at this point of time. There was none to stand with him whatsoever anywhere in the entire world. No one stayed in his kingdom either. In the face of all that, Christ simply said, I am still unchangeable, don't try and change me. He would not be changed at all. And when Peter saw that Christ would not be changed, and Peter, because he loved his Lord, could not bear separation from him, yielded to Christ's leadership at that point of time, and said, wash my hands, my feet, my head, all of me at, at this moment. Now let's go back now to the story of Abraham to note the same principle in regard to him. Uh-oh. We know the story of Jesus in some page after the Christ, chapter 4, the test of faith. Now Abraham had failed very badly on two, two previous occasions. They were when he went down to Egypt with his wife and told the king that, that, that she was his sister. And the second occasion was when Abraham had uh, brought about the birth of Isaac, uh, of Ishmael, through his marriage to Hagar. And because of this, we read, we read on page 147, his faith had not been perfect. God had called Abraham to be the father of the faithful, and his life was to stand an example of faith to 16 generations, but his faith had not been perfect. Now, in both of those situations, we find that uh, Abraham had resorted to his own devisings to bring about the commands of the word of God, and failed very badly. His faith had not been perfect. Now this sentence is very impressive to my mind because it shows that when Abraham tried to do God's work his own way, this was imperfect faith. Right? Imperfect faith. And as this was disastrous to the cause of God at that point of time. Now because of this, Abraham had to face a test which would prove that he had gained the faith which he previously had not attained to. In other words, that he might reach the highest standard, God subjected to another test of trust which man was ever called to endure. <coughs> now you think about the sacrifice of Isaac, remember, or the command to sacrifice Isaac, and we, we were very quickly realised this was in the the greatest pressure could it be brought to bear upon a man to sacrifice his own son. And under these conditions, you would naturally seek for a change in God. Something who must change God's mind to deliver him from this requirement. Picture yourself, for instance, right now, being called upon to pass over the same ground with your own personal children. It would be hard, wouldn't it? In fact, I guess we find it almost impossible to do it. And we'd be searching in our minds for some way in which we could put pressure upon God to change from that uh, requirement of something else altogether. Now going across to page 154 and 155 of the Patriarchs of Prophets, I read this, these words. The sacrifice required of Abraham was not alone for his own good, nor solely for the benefit of succeeding generations. <coughs> But it was the instruction of the sinners and darkness in heaven and other worlds. The field of controversy between Christ and Satan, the field in which the plan of salvation is wrought out, is the last book of the universe. Because Abraham had shown a lack of faith in God's promises, Satan accused him before the angels and before God, having failed to comply with the condition of the covenant and as of unworthy of his blessing. So, because of Abraham's failure on the previous occasion, Satan had accused him of unfaithfulness to the divine covenant. 
how God desired to meet that charge that Satan laid against uh, Abraham. And so I read God's response, page 155. God desired to prove the Lord of his sin before heaven. That's point number one. To demonstrate that nothing less than perfect events can be accepted. Point number two. And to open more fully before the before the plan of salvation. Now let's fix those three points in our minds this morning, shall we? One, God desired to prove the Lord of his sin before all heaven. Two, to demonstrate that nothing less than perfect events can be accepted and to open more fruit before them the plan of salvation. This, these were God's purposes in calling Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. Let's go back now and trace the story through a bit more closely to, uh, to confirm the fact that it was God indeed who commanded this sacrifice to be offered. And I turn back to page 148. Uh, <coughs> We'll note first of all that uh, Satan was very concerned about uh, this command on God's part because Satan feared that Abraham would indeed uh, recover from his lack of previous faith and give a demonstration God required. I'd like to go to the review and hell at this point, uh, March the 3rd, 1874. Which is the way it talks about Satan's attitude towards the sacrificial system and uh, the supplies of God to him when he uh, was first instituted.
same paragraph we read, uh, take now thy son and only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. That one must be obeyed and he did not delay. <coughs> that one must be obeyed. Now, whose commands must be obeyed? God or Satan's? Right, God must be obeyed. Therefore, from whom did that command come? And from God, absolutely. <coughs> Now it's true, of course, that uh, it might seem illogical to believe that God does not destroy at the same time believe God gave the command to sacrifice Abraham. It may seem illogical. But uh, there's abundant evidence to prove, of course, that God did in fact give the command to Abraham to go and slay his son. But at the same time, this does not modify the principle that God does not destroy. Although it's a profound truth to be understood as the a little further in just a moment or two. Now, we learned that Abraham was called upon to make this sacrifice in order to recover from his lack of, his earlier lack of faith. We went down to Egypt with Sarah and told the king of Egypt that Sarah was his sister, not his wife. And secondly, of course, in the birth of Ishmael, in the place of Isaac, who came later. So Abraham confirmed in his own mind that it was indeed the call of God to go, and he went. As you know, of course, he went through the preparations, and uh, finally was about to slay him, and God stopped him right there and then in his tracks. Now going back to page 155 in Patriarchs and Prophets, we find that heavenly beings were witnesses of the scene as the faith of Abraham and, 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 and the sufficient of Isaac was tested. This word submission is a very vital word in this connection, of course. Submission is our total surrender to God's will, our acceptance of his ways, our unquestioning obedience to what he has commanded. And both Isaac who shared the faith of Abraham and they were submissive at this time to the will of God in this respect. I turn now to, to the book Education, page uh, 253, and note these words. Faith is trusting God, believing that he loves us and knows best what is for our good. Faith is trusting God, believing that he loves us and knows best what is for our good. Now, there are three words involved here which I'd like to emphasize. Trusting God is one. Trust, love, and knowledge. Now, if we really believe that God truly loves us, then we have the confidence that he will do only that which is for our best good. And if he knows what is for our best good, likewise, he will also choose the best for us under all circumstances. Now, in the book, Desire Ladies, page 790, a very special statement there in regard to God's attitude of love toward his children, toward you and me. And this concerns the great covenant made with Jesus Christ before the world even was formed. And that covenant was confirmed by God to Jesus Christ after the resurrection, when Christ uh, came back again from uh, the heavenly courts. Page 790, Desire of Ages. The Father ratified the covenant made with Christ that he would receive repentance of him and he would love them even as he loves his son. He would love them even as he loves his son. So, do we believe, do we know that God loves Jesus Christ? Absolutely, because he's, he, he's only begotten son. Do we also believe that God loves us as he loves Jesus Christ? That's quite a love, isn't it? There's no great love that God can show toward his people. So then, when God loves us to that extent, then naturally, of course, he is going to do for us the best for our good, for our interest, for our health, for our well-being, and so on. So we have these two words. We believe that God, we, we trust God then, because he loves us and knows best what is for our good. We don't ask questions. We simply accept what God has given to us to do. So this is what it says, Thus, instead of our own leaders to choose his way, 
which of course is total submission to his will because of our trust and confidence in him. So the word submission comes from page 155 and page 5 of the prophets where the submission of Abraham and Isaac were tested in this great drama. The time was more severe or far more severe than that which we brought upon Adam. Compliance with the prohibition that led upon our first parents involved no suffering, but the command to Abraham demanded the most agonizing sacrifice. Now I say again, can't you imagine or can't you see that Abraham had been searching for some alternative, some way of changing God's mind, of, of some different uh, procedure that in, 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 in anything but the sacrifice of his son, anything but. And for Abraham to go through with that command, as he did, was a, a tremendous demonstration of his total submission to the actual will of God, his forsaking of the principle of trying to change God, his willingness to take things exactly as God had uh, laid them out before him. Now, I, I like the fact that uh, all heaven applauded his fidelity. All heaven applauded his fidelity. Satan's accusations were shown to be false. God declared to his servant, Now I know that you fear God, not with saying Satan's charges, seeing that you have not told your son, your only son, from me. God's covenant confirmed to Abraham by the oath before the intelligence of other worlds. This was easily rewarded. Now, did God himself need to have this verification of Abraham's faithfulness? Not God. But who did? The angels did, right? They needed it because they will not permit to go back into heaven anybody who falls short of the protection of love, trust, and submission. Now, before we go any further in the story of let's go back to Adam in the Garden of Eden. I was asked yesterday to be sure and uh, look at their experience to see how they sought to change God in that Garden of Eden drama. Let's go to Genesis, the third chapter, shall we? God plainly said that uh, they're not to part of the not to take of the fruit of that one tree in the garden, which was the special tree of Isaac and evil. And Satan came to them and proposed changes in this whole system that would appeal to their minds and did appeal to their minds enough to have them take of that fruit needed. Let's <coughs> go to the first several verses of this chapter, sorry, chapter three. So I'd like to read to me, please, verse uh, 1 down to verse uh, 6. And then take verse 7. Wait, what the 7? Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, He shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree... Which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Thank you. Now obviously, of course, Satan's whole objective was to, was to, make, was to cause them to change. They believed in what God required, or at least they, they, they responded to what God required. Satan said to them that, uh, well, first of all, Sir Dwight points out in Page Arms and Prophets that Satan came and flattered Eve by telling her how beautiful she was, and to that she responded quite uh, warmly. Then he raised the question that uh, how, how could God possibly prove such a beautiful creature for partaking of the tree of the garden? And uh, she then replied in a kind 
of uh, weakened way that God had said you shall eat lest you die. It was not what God had said at all, but that they would surely die. And she then believed Satan when he said that uh, God was trying to limit them, to confine them to a lower level of existence than they rightfully deserved. And he made her feel that God did not love her as much as, he, as much as she thought he had. And she therefore partook of the fruit and ate of it. And when God came into the garden to accost them over their wickedness and their, and their sin, what was the attitude of Adam and Eve at that point in time? It was self-defense, it was not. And they more than Adam blamed God for giving him this woman who had led him into sin. And therefore, they were requiring God to change his evaluation of the situation himself to move their condemnation and to excuse their wrong behaviour. And once again, how much uh, do we find God moving in that direction? Not at all, not in the slightest degree. God was quite uh, firm, quite resolved, quite fixed in his position that they had done wrong and that they were therefore to suffer the consequences of what they had done. Now, if we were to go to the end time Bible from Kavaka, we find that this determination of man's part to change God is very persistent. In fact, it's the basis of all sin, it's pure Babylonianism, it is uh, disobedience, it is transgression, and it is certainly not ending into God's rest. Now, back to Abraham again for just a moment, page 155. We ask ourselves the question now, in what sense is Abraham tempted of God? Does God tempt anyone? No, he doesn't. Let's get the Bible comment again to read a statement in regard to this uh, experience of Abraham and the temptation which came to him. Page 1094, volume 1 of the Bible commentary. What is temptation? It's the mean by which those who claim to be children of God are tested and tried. We read that God tempted Abraham, that he tempted the children of Israel. This means that he permitted, that he permitted circumstances to, to, to test their faith and to look to him for help. This means that he permitted circumstances to, to occur to test their faith and lead them to look to him for help. Now, what circumstances had uh, occurred in Abraham's life to cause him to be tempted? What circumstances? Right. Most importantly, the birth of Ishmael, and along with that, the experience in Egypt when he told the king that Sarah was his sister. And this is more about a situation that needed to be corrected. The situation now was that Satan had a very just cause to accuse Abraham before the angels, before God, of having failed to comply with the conditions of the covenant as a blessings. So now, this situation developed and needed to be created and God created it by requiring Abraham to take his son and sacrifice him on Mount Moriah. God desired to prove the loyalty of his son before all heaven. Did God succeed? Yes. He certainly did. Now, when God called upon Adam to sacrifice an animal and the subsequent uh, patriarchs, the the priests, and so on. Let's emphasize the point that when God called a man to sacrifice an animal, he was not there by making him to be a killer or a destroyer. He was that already. When did man become a destroyer? Right. When he partook of the tree, of the tree in the garden, then he became a destroyer. And when he offered a sacrifice, he was only acting out that which he already was, so that he might better understand what he was, right? And certainly, of course, God was not a killer because he was not making man to be a killer at that point, so he already was that. And when Abraham showed his absolute submission to God's will, he did prove his loyalty to God and the angels. At that point, that was, that was quite successfully accomplished. To demonstrate that nothing less than perfect obedience can be accepted, 
Now, what do we think about with the, from these words of perfect obedience? What thought occurs to our minds in regard to that? What, is, what in your mind is perfect obedience? Are they each that righteousness? Uh, righteousness. Is righteousness? Yes. In right doing, do you mean? You mean right doing? Right doing. Right doing? Yes. Yes, it's, it's more than that. It's also right being. But in the far we tend to think in terms of this and that command, thou shalt, thou shalt not. Now we realize, of course, that perfect obedience involves total submission to God's will, total commitment to Him, and the total deliverance from the disposition to call upon God to change. And nothing less than perfect obedience can be accepted. And find to open more fully before them the plan of salvation. Now, when Abraham took his son to Mount Moriah and was about to sacrifice him, do you suppose he then felt by experience what God felt in his own experience? Absolutely. And there's no way which, which could uh, better have been done than that. And the angel looked down and likewise saw the same principle, the same uh, experience in Abraham and thereby better understood the great plan of salvation. So from this whole experience, Abraham came forth much enriched spiritually, a far better man, a far richer man spiritually than before it all happened. When, when, when we learn to abandon any thought of causing God to change or asking God to change, we too shall come forth much richer, much better for that. Now I'll leave this, this uh, point now as we come to the end of our study period. Anyway, I want to start a new theme with our next study period. So, any questions or comments to make at this point? Yes. I can see in, in that picture that's just been illustrated the struggle. Abraham had a choice now. He had his choice to do or God's words. Right. And it wasn't a sin and a struggle. Because he had to make a decision which way. And here's where we can make it sound so easy. Right? It sounds so easy. Oh, yeah, choose God's words. But when it comes down to the actual experience, you choose God's words, which we know are the actual things in the sun all the way. We find that he went through a struggle for what, three days? Yeah. It was a tremendous struggle. So, last night when I was talking to you, I don't mean to add, it's simple in a sense, it's not struggling for everything, but there's a struggle for us to obey and to follow on, that struggle from last day. Sure, because obedience looks like being uh, disastrous, right? Just the thought of me down to God works in our works. Now, when God gives to us a command and we carry out the command by His power, we're working, but it's God's work because it comes from Him, right? Don't, don't get the impression, of course, that when we do God's work, we're not doing anything at all. We, 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 we're working very hard. But we're doing, we're doing God's command, and therefore God's works. Right. Any questions or comments? Let's take a break then. It's now... Uh, Thank you.